Hello, welcome to College Theater Auditions, hosted by The Growing Studio and Playbill. I'm Danny George. And I'm Nicole Johnson, Director of Operations at The Growing Studio. Uh, we are so happy to be here today uh, to talk to you uh, and to talk to uh, two universities. Uh, we have Otterbein and Kent State University, which is going to be wonderful. Um, but before we get there, we want to talk about uh, today's holiday, and that's Juneteenth. Uh, we'd like to share some stories. We'd like to talk, um, Nicole and I, together. Uh, yeah. and I am learning about Juneteenth, uh, like many of you. Uh, and I am here to be educated and to learn and to be an ally. Uh, and I hope, hope we can spread that joy throughout. So Nicole, can you yeah. tell us a little bit about Juneteenth? For sure. So happy Juneteenth, everyone. It's a extremely multifaceted kind of intersectional holiday. And I'll explain more about that after I give you some history that's actually available to you too if you visit NAACP.org or Juneteenth.com. Both of these are resources that are available to you. I'm pretty much reading directly from those spaces. So as we're working on this stuff as allies um, and just for people who may not know about the history of African-American oppression, um, I think it's best that we all just jump in there and do our education by jumping online. You know what I mean? So I'm going to read directly from it. Uh, Juneteenth is the uh, nationally celebrated commemoration of the ending of slavery in the United States. On January 1st, 1980, Juneteenth became an official state holiday through the efforts of Al Edwards, an African-American state legislator. Um, and the successful passage of this bill marked Juneteenth as the first emancipation celebration granted official state recognition. Um, it was on June 19th. Uh, that the Union soldiers led by Major General Gordon Granger landed at Galveston, Texas with news that the war had ended and that the enslaved were now free. But let's note that this was actually two and a half years after President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, uh, which became official on January 1st, 1863. Um, and so the Emancipation Proclamation had little impact on the Texans due to the minimal number of Union troops to enforce the new executive order. Um, so for decades though, what's interesting about this, annual celebrations flourished, growing uh, continuously with each passing year, sometimes up to 20,000 African-Americans celebrating with food and with dancing and with good, like beautiful clothing, uh, essentially it's similar to church services now. Um, and after the Great Migration and the Civil Rights era, Juneteenth was not as widely celebrated as we get into the 1900s, most likely due to economic and cultural forces, um, leading to the decline of Juneteenth activities and participation. And then of course, classrooms and textbooks were not including the information, um, which limits our ability to know more about what, it, what the celebrations were. Mm -hmm. uh, but that being said, friends, my personal opinion of the holiday uh, is separate from those facts that I said are always available. Um, and I, I'm so thankful that this platform and the growing studio allows me to be able to talk about um, these things. Um, the day Juneteenth was a declaration um, for off the coast of Texas, right? Sharing and exclaiming those things to slaves, uh, former slaves to say that they were now free. Uh, but other forms of oppression persist. Um, and they did directly after that day. Things like the black codes, things like Jim Crow slavery laws, uh, things like uh, slavery today in prisons. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about those things, the black codes were restrictive laws designed to limit the freedoms of African-Americans and ensure that um, they were still available as cheap labor, just as much, as, uh, just as much of a, a burden as slavery, in my opinion. Uh, Jim Crow laws were a collection of state and local statutes that legalized racial segregation that lasted for about 100 years, uh, leading to other forms of discrimination and bigotry, things that we've seen um, that we know more about, like, of course, Rosa Parks and uh, the Little Rock Nine, and we know those stories, but those things let, were living in the midst of Jim Crow segregation uh, and causing such an uproar. And then things like today's prison system, uh, considering like the horrible labor issues connected with using inmates um, at extremely low paid wages uh, to build the country. That's been our history. Um, so as I said, Juneteenth was a declaration, but what a story to keep thinking that we tell someone or a group of people that they have freedom and then time and time again, it is not true. Right. The structures right. persist. 
And so interesting holiday. Give me a thought. Yeah, I, I I love that Juneteenth is uniquely black, and not not is it only uniquely black? It's uniquely African American, which is a completely different thing. Right. You know, I, I I find that all the holidays that we celebrate are based on religion, and a lot of times, you know, we find oppression through religion, but we don't have holidays based on oppression through race, which has not really been a thing uh, until uh, blacks and whites in America. Right. So it's wonderful that there's a time where we can talk and discuss and uh, learn. Um, yeah, I, I think it's fantastic. Um, you know, we've we've known each other for forever, Nicole. Mm -hmm. for, for before going studio, Playbill, et cetera, Nicole and I grew up together as as children in Miami, Florida, as as babies. Yeah. And um, you know, we, we, I see the world differently. I know you see the world differently, uh, but you know, what, what's huge for me, Nicole, is I am, um, we, we've always had this relationship and I never forgot, you know, we, we interviewed you for a position at TGS forever ago. Uh, we went in another direction. And then when you came back again and interviewed, uh, you got the job. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I remember you coming to me and going, Hey, I feel like, you know, I might, I didn't get the job the first time because I was black mm -hmm. and that didn't even enter my mind. Uh, you know, that, that wasn't a decision for me, but the fact that you even had to think about that, right? the fact that that even entered your mind uh, is so clear uh, that this is an existing issue that is more massive than we can even comprehend as Caucasian people. Yeah, and it's like well, I said. I feel like I didn't get a job because I'm half Caucasian or whatever. Like I, I, I never, I never find that. You know, I, I don't feel that way. Mm -hmm. And it's so, um, it's extremely layered in that. Like that might have been one of the things that I was feeling, uh, but because uh, there are other experiences that I've not only physically, personally, as a young woman have experienced now, but then my history, my genealogy, it's like in my trauma right. uh, is a part of my genetics. So we can feel so many things, even in arriving in a room that is new mm. with a new white person, mm. but I might feel it from several other experiences. And I've worked in the industry as a performer and have felt the vying for the one African American spot. Right, there's always always has to be just one, and it's it becomes a token situation. Yeah, and it's okay, honestly, for some of us. Some of us are okay being the token. I currently, I'm that person that I'm okay with that because I personally, I guess, I have the the wherewithal for it or right. the um, the interest. It's just a part of my makeup that I guess I've. Uh, created the resilience or have given been given and blessed with the resilience to be like, I'm okay being that token, but yeah. it is not like some people are not up here to educate all day. Right. I can do that. You know, people shouldn't have to either. Right. Shouldn't have to, but I know that someone has to be right. a part of this, right. helping us, di directing us to the right websites, directing us, helping us understand, telling stories. I'm down to do that all day, every day. Cause that's just who I am, but not every black person can do that for you right now. And that's why it's very important that we go to these websites and we spend our own time educating ourselves uh, and figuring out if we actually value, like, is it a part of our values that we care for black and brown people? If so, how does that show up on your values every day? How right, that it's not derived from guilt. Yeah, and it's okay to feel guilty because it's on a human emotion. It is right. totally fine. If anything, if that guilt moves you to shift your life or shift the way that you value black and brown people, Cool beans, right? Because Juneteenth can be that day where you say, it's not the day that I felt bad. It's the day about my white guilt or whatever, or my fragility. It's the day that I said, I need to shift that. And that's gargantuan. That's like a superhero for me. That's like, thank you for taking the time to make a really big decision to shift things that have been so concrete in yeah. your life, in your institution, in your business, wherever. Yeah. And it, it's such a tricky line, you know, because yeah. we talk about this all the time, but, you know, running the company and being the token, you know, we, we have other black employees, but at the end of the day, you know, when we come on and we're like, Hey, we're going to do this seminar, it feels like it has to be led by someone who is black. And then we go, 
okay, well, we, we have to ask Nicole. And then it puts you in a position that's strange and uncomfortable. You know, so you can't, no matter what, you know, I can't lead it. I don't want to have to ask you to lead it. It's it's an ongoing conversation and it's an ongoing navigation about what is right, right. Uh, and, and, and how to do the right thing. And how to be honest, honestly, that's yeah. all we can do at yeah. this point, because it's going to be messy. This work is going to be messy. I mean, if I have generational trauma, I can't imagine what the generations of people who were, or the ancestry of those who oppressed, I can't imagine, I can't even imagine. If I'm experiencing the trauma of my mother's 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 mother, then there has to be some connection too. So things are going to bubble up. Yeah and it's going to be messy and they're going to conflict as they have done in the past and that is okay because if anything we got to go through the the messy and the the horrible in order to get to the liberation and unfortunately cons considering the pedagogy of the oppressed paulo freire which is um uh like a study that i feel or like a an essay that many of us can spend some time with the oppressed will often be the ones that liberate us all and so mm -hmm. You putting me in this position to be able to share, I'm I'm available for it, right? Not everyone's gonna be available for it, but I'm down because I believe in that concept that yes, the the oppressed are gonna be able to see more. We have a different perspective of the world. We know the inequities and we can I get that as as business, but as a friend, I'm like, I don't I don't wanna have to ask Nicole to do all of these things because you know this is the time or because she's black like it, it feels it feels bizarre feels bizarre probably feels weird and um unfortunate and like you're you're sliding me in some ways or whatever it could be but for the sake of all things that are good we ought to just be honest with one another and push through those things until we can actually create a more equitable society. Because if we have a conversation and then things shift yeah. in space in our workplace, in this industry, boom, yeah. that's all I wanted. That's all well, we wanted. And you know, the only way I think we're gonna do that is to do it together. Yep, I'm down. I love you. Love you. Um, can we bring on our guests? I'm sorry, we, we talked for a long time. No, I think it's great, thanks, let's do it. Yeah, are, are they there? Hi. Oh, hello. Hi. It's an honor to celebrate Juneteenth with you. Thank you. Oh, good to see you guys. Uh, can, can you go ahead and introduce yourself? Start with Terry. Hi, I'm Terry Kent. I'm the musical theater coordinator at Kent State University and the producing artistic director at Courthouse Theater, our summer professional venue. Hey, Eric. Yeah. I'm Erin Kane. Um, I'm the director of recruitment for the Otterbein University Department of Theater and Dance. Hi, I'm Tom Christopher Warren. I'm one of the associate professors at Otterbein University. Awesome. So while we're on this topic, I'd love uh, to, to hear from you guys about what you are doing now um, to encourage diversity in your program uh, and what you are doing to make sure uh, that your Black students are treated fairly. Uh, within your programs? So picking up on um, what you and Nicole were talking about, I think two key things that I heard were um, education and honesty, honest conversation. Um, two things that we're doing in our program are seeking out honest and active conversations um, with our current students and our black alumni about our curriculum and our program. Um, and where there are gaps and what we can do to um, fix um, any problems that we may have or to address these issues of inequality, um, whether in terms of our productions or casting. Another thing is Otterbein University um, is really proud to announce that we are forming a truth, racial healing and transformation center. Um, so the purpose of these centers is to work to dismantle a belief in race-based hierarchy, um, especially in higher education. So we're gonna be partnering with them um, to educate ourselves about inequality in higher education, where that inequality might exist in our program and what we can do to address that. Thank you. Terry. Hi, uh, well, the school, the college and the university uh, have all put um, committees into action and release statements. But I would like to share with you a statement that was crafted by our performance faculty 
in the wake of George Floyd's murder. This is a pledge of support, action, and solidarity. We as members of the performance area faculty are committed to making the after training at Kent State University anti-racist. Our black communities and our communities of color are affected and harmed by systematic and systemic racism that is inherently unequal, unjust, and violent. We acknowledge that striving to be anti-racist must be intentional and unceasing, and we are committed to implementing anti-racist ideas, policies, and teaching in our classes and mentoring. It's wonderful. Now, how we take that from the page and put that into action is something we're all working on right now. Yes, yes. I do have a question from our uh, viewers. This is Melissa Johnson from Orlando. Um, and we're kind of moving into more the logistics of the university. How many steps into your action? I'm sorry, I, I couldn't, I didn't get that. Oh, couldn't hear it. Basically, I was just, I have a question from Melissa Johnson from Orlando. Can you hear me now? Yes. I can Tom, you. Tom, do you mind muting your microphone when you're not speaking? I think that might be the Yes. I'm not sure how to do that on my phone, but I will work on figuring that out. <laughs> yeah, no problem. <laughs> and so uh, what I was asking is Melissa Johnson from Orlando is asking, how many students do you accept in your acting and your MT programs? Well, between, we shoot for between 16 and 20. You know, it's always a numbers game. Um, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. Uh, but never never less than 16, we have gone over 20. Yeah, so at Otterbein, we aim for 16. Um, ideally, eight musical theater, eight acting, but it's not a perfect science. Um, one thing that we do though, intentionally, is keep our class sizes small and the reason is for hands-on, one-on-one intimate training um, in both of our musical theater and acting programs. Thank you. This next question is from Johnny Dombrowski from Colorado. How diverse is your program? Uh, well, we've been working diligently to diversify our program because we need to tell stories that are not Eurocentric. Mm. And uh, musical theater for the past century has been exactly that. It, it is a racist art form. Um, it's mostly written by white men about white people, written for white audiences. And uh, as we continue to see um, artists of color develop and bring their work forward, we are committed to telling those stories. And in order to tell those stories authentically, we need a diverse population of students. I will tell you that our class coming in in the fall uh, is 50% uh, of our students are diversity students. Mm -hmm. Aaron or Tom? Aaron or Tom, you guys with us? Sorry, yeah. No worries. Can you repeat that? I'm... Yeah, the question was uh, how diverse is your student population? Yeah, um, so like Terry said, you know, it is a work in progress for us. Um, we are aiming to diversify our program. We are branching out, um, looking in new areas to try and do so. Um, our incoming freshman class, both between performance and design and technology, I would say is 25% diverse. That's great. Thanks, and so then, um, as we're talking about diversity, I know that there are um, other people of color that can fall within your um, your pool of students. Um, and I think as we're talking about black and brown students in particular on Juneteenth, um, I think it's also we're, we're open essentially to hearing methods of ways that you're reaching out directly to those students. Um, this next question that we have is um, Aaron, uh, Maya from Wisconsin. Uh, Aaron's asking, do you award financial aid? So every student that comes into our program, whether um, design and technology, performance, or the Bachelor of Arts in Theater, receives a talent award. Um, this talent award is renewable all four years. Um, so it's guaranteed to you all four years when you come through the door. And that's also on top of your financial aid. So what you receive filling out that FAFSA. 
on average, our students receive some of the highest financial aid on campus. Um, so about 80% of their tuition is covered um, at Otterbein, which is amazing. So we offer um, hefty and healthy financial aid packages for our students. Thank you. Financial aid at Kent State University through FAFSA, of course, is uh, extremely supportive. Uh, and many of our students receive financial aid. We also have a, a many scholarships. We have the Oscar Ritchie scholarships, which are specifically for diversity students. Uh, we have limited talented based scholarships, but it's something that we've been working on and fundraising in order to increase those opportunities. We do, however, have what are called creative arts awards. And these are talent based awards through the Honors College. Uh, so they do require that the student is eligible to enter the Honors College and to work at that level. Thank you. This question is from uh, Amy Golden from Long Island. Uh, they are a college audition coach. Do you have any plans for how pre-screens and our auditions will be held for 2021? <laughs> So funny um, you should ask that because I was recently in on a meeting this week with the Unifieds, the National Unified Auditions. And we are discussing this. How are we going to um, have auditions in a global pandemic? Because unfortunately, I don't think COVID will be gone by the time college auditions run around. So we are working on finding a way to do it safely um, within CDC state guidelines so that is a work in progress in terms of the National Unifieds. At Otterbein, we plan on hosting all of our on-campus auditions virtually, um, just for the safety of the students auditioning and for our faculty and students. So you said Unifieds are, are doing not doing virtual. It's a work in progress. So okay. we um, are meeting um, monthly to talk about this, to figure out um, how we're going to host auditions safely and following CDC state and venue guidelines. Um, but in terms of Otterbein University, our auditions this year will be virtual. Um, and we're going to try and find a way though to have that college experience, to be on Otterbein's campus, to make it as personal as possible. We're still discussing. Uh, it's interesting to me, if you read the New York Times yesterday, uh, it talked about, you know, colleges in the face of COVID. And um, it, it basically said that the, these universities are saying, yes, yes, we're opening for face-to-face -face classes. But behind the scenes and anonymously, they are saying that they're terrified. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought it was um, a very truthful assessment. Uh, yes, we want to be back in the classroom. Yes, we want to bring people to that campus. That is part of the college experience. Certainly as artists, you know, in the theater, it is a communal art form. Um, but we have to take care of each other and we have to take care of our students. So as things change and develop, we have to remain flexible to what that's going to be. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say that our goal would be to use uh, virtual um, access for screening auditions and to limit that down to the students we are very interested in and then ask them, invite them to come to campus in small groups so that they are able to maintain their own safety and uh, keep our current students safe and everyone healthy. That's great. Great, thanks. Uh, we got another question from uh, Alicia Green from Texas. She says, I have a stage management student that is looking to get into a competitive stage management VA program. Uh, what are reps looking for and what do we think she needs to focus on to get seen and chosen? So at Otterbein, uh, the majority of our stage management students um, pursue the BFA in design and technology. Um, and what we are looking for is students who have experience. We're not saying, you know, that you've had to stage manage every production that your high school has done or that you have all these credentials but that you have experience in a theater and a passion for learning, right? That's the most important thing for us is um, students that have a passion for theater that are willing to grow, that are willing to be taught. Um, and so I would recommend that this student put together a portfolio, you know, that has um, some of the work that they've done, whether it's cues, um, you know, any kind of dramaturgy, anything that they've done for any productions in high school 
And in that um, accepted interview, which we ask all students to pre-screen on accepted, you know, talk about your experience, talk about your passion for theater um, and your willingness to grow. Thank you. I echo everything Aaron said. Um, and I'd add to that that just this past year, we hired a, a, a faculty member, a stage manager as a faculty member. Mm. Um, and his name is Tom Humes, and he is a person of color. Uh, and if you are interested in more information about that, you can get in contact with me and I'll put you in contact with Tom. That's great. Uh, this next question is from Juan Pablo Madero from Guadalajara, Mexico. Uh, Juan wants to know, what advice would you give to someone choosing their audition material? I would say, pick, and I know you're gonna hear this a lot and every, you all do show something that shows your best you, right? We want to see who you are. And that may seem vague, but really it requires a lot of introspection, right? What are you passionate about? What's the voice you want to bring to the artistic landscape? What do you want to say, particularly in a world right now that is so vibrant and rich and dynamic and charged with points of view? What's your point of view? And what material can you find that showcases that? And I would say avoid at all costs, trying to think about what what we want to see, right? What I want to, wanting to show us what you think we want is is a sword that you should not want to die on. <laughs> Definitely just show us what your voice is and, and where your heart lies. That's That'll show you to your best. So Juan, this is what I would, this is what I often tell my students. We get hung up on material, you know, and material is the vehicle. We're assessing talent. So if we think of um, the material as a vehicle, uh, I'm gonna make a comparison here. Uh, I can drive a Honda Fit or I can drive a Cadillac and they're gonna get me to the same location. One vehicle, like if I'm gonna be driving in town, in downtown Kent, Ohio, which is not that big, I probably would do better in a Fit because I can navigate around, I can get where I need to go. But if I'm going on a long road trip, I want to keep back in a Cadillac. <laughs> so again, it is, you know, the vehicle, what you do with it, your acting, your potential is what I'm looking at. I love that answer. <laughs> you know, Juan Pablo has another question. Uh, what is the most common mistake um, sorry, Tom, I, I think I need to mute again. I apologize. Oh, sorry. No worries. Uh, so yeah, this is the question again from Juan Pablo. What is the most common mistake or mistakes that you see in applications or auditions? What are your thoughts on college audition coaches? I don't know that I would call it a mistake. You know, nerves just get in the way and that's especially at a unified audition, you can have one bad day and it affects a range of, of uh, experiences for you. So it's about finding a way to channel those nerves into something that is productive for you and something that can ground you. Uh, you know, I, I ask my students to wear something that makes them feel powerful, sing something that makes them feel powerful, have a, 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 a mantra or something that lets them ground themselves before walking in the room and really before walking in the building. Uh, just sort of throwing that up in the air and, and taking, the, um, you know, not, not finding ways to empower yourself. I, I guess that would be a mistake if I want to use the word mistake. Terry, what do you think? Oh, Tom, it's so hard because, you know, <laughs> I've never not cast someone or accepted them because I didn't like what they were wearing or I didn't like the material that they used. Um, but there is um, a confidence that is very attractive. Um, desperation is never attractive. <laughs> and, and nerve will uh, project a sen that sense of desperation. So, you know, as someone who has stage fright and I didn't act for 11 years because it just wasn't worth it to me. And then finally thought I have to address this so I can talk to students about this. Um, I finally realized that when any time I have an opportunity to share my talent with people that 
it's a blessing and I'm giving them a gift. Mm -hmm. And you never give someone a gift and then think, oh, I wonder if it's good enough. You know, you're excited, you know, you pick it out. It's a special thing. And you know that the person will, well, I can't ever think of somebody not being gracious when I've given them a gift. Mm -hmm. So if you can think of it that way and that for those few moments, those few minutes, you are getting to do what you love doing most in the world. And that there are a million people who would be dying to have that same opportunity. So relish in it. That's so lovely. Uh, this question is from Facebook, uh, from Debbie, I'm sorry, I'm gonna butcher this, Dan Zizak Filer. Uh, what is expected for a pre-screen audition and what are the sons my, step, my son should take to submit one? That's a great question. So um, we use Accepted, which is pre-screen software. Um, last year and this year, we are a part of the common pre-screen. So we participate in that at Otterbein University. Um, we ask for two contrasting songs, one prior to 1970, uh, one post-1970. Mm -hmm. So a ballad um, or an up-tempo song. And then we just ask for two monologues, 60 to 90 seconds a piece from a published play. Um, all of that will be submitted on accepted. We also ask for a dance demonstration. So don't worry, you know, we don't, we're not asking for prima donnas or, or perfect technique, um, but we just wanna be able to see you move, right? See how you move in a space. Um, we open on September 1, and we close on December 1 for BFA performance. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So although we have done pre-screening this past year, uh, we have primarily held our auditions in person. Um, like I said, we're gonna be switching formats. It'll probably be a hybrid this coming year. Our requirements for an audition are two, uh, song selections, approximately 32 bars each, uh, up-tempo and a ballad, and one monologue, and we ask for a contemporary monologue from a published play. And what we're looking for is a human connection to the material. We also have a dance audition, uh, and it, we, we have some criteria if someone is going to submit online. Um, and we usually do a pitch matching exercise as well. Um, can we talk a little bit about dance? Because you both had mentioned it. What what's what is the dance program like uh, for musical theater majors at your at your schools? We hope you love to dance, and if you don't, you will love to the dance by the time you graduate <laughs> at Otterbein University. Uh, um, Tom's laughing because he knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, dance is incredibly important at Otterbein. We train true triple threats in our musical theater program. So as a musical theater student, you will be dancing every morning at 8 a.m., five days a week. Um, we offer classes, modern, ballet, tap, jazz. We bring in guest artists. Um, frequently, we have dance workshops. And amazingly, we have a dance minor. So um, if you are interested in that minor, you can apply for that um, as well as the musical theater degree. And um, we, a, a part of that dance class is you would also take a choreography class and a dance history um, on top of, of your dance training. Um, we also offer four levels. So if you're coming in basic, that's okay. But by the time you graduate, I promise you will be um, at another level. And our faculty are really great about evaluating that. So they will shift you. If, if they're seeing growth in a genre of dance, they will move you. Um, so we offer basic, intermediate, intermediate, advanced, and advanced. So dance is very, very important at Otterbein University. Well, we are the school of theater and dance at Kent State University. So we also have a dance major. Uh, we have a, a BFA in dance. We have a BA in dance. We have a dance minor. Uh, we're housed in the same building. And uh, there is a specific musical theater curriculum that uh, follows every semester of four years for the students. However, students can audition for uh, placement in the pre-professional dance program. And uh, 
take classes in that area as well. So yeah, you need to love to dance. Uh, <laughs> and and we recognize that actors, there are different requirements for different types. Um, so not everyone has to be a triple threat chorus person, but you, you know, you can play a lead, but you better be able to meet the basic qualifications of the role as written. Nice. Thank you. Nice. So we have one more question here. Ashley Wood from Atlanta says, how can I stand out in my audition? So I wouldn't, I would let Tom address this, but just on, um, on our end in terms of the pre-screen. So using Accepted, you have a wild card option. Um, where you can upload anything that you want to that wild card. I highly suggest you do that because it's your opportunity to show us your personality. What makes you unique? So whether that's playing an instrument, um, whether that's doing gymnastics, I've seen someone make avocado toast. It was brilliant. Right? <laughs> it's quirky. It's different. Um, so show us your personality. Show us who makes you you. Um, that's something that sticks with us, and we will remember that. Oh, you're the girl that made avocado toast. Um, so, I mean, it sounds strange, but but use that wildcard option. Show us that personality, and I promise you, we will remember you. Yeah, I echo Erin. Uh, that wildcard for me in, in reviewing the um, the pre screens, the wildcard was just it was a way to connect it was a way to see something past the 16 or 32 bars past the dance audition um and into something that was much more personal and unique don't don't do something weird for the sake of being weird if it happens to be weird and you love to do it great um and in terms of standing out in the audition room for me it's the ones who have critical thought you know the one who engage with us in conversation and it's not about i'm going to walk into a room and aim to talk politics, but really engaging with, we are people behind the table and we are there to engage with you. And um, if you don't get caught up in, in the nerves and can really be present in the joy that Terry was talking about, that gift that you have to share with us, that for me stands out among the, the throng. Thank you. Uh, now, this next question is specifically uh, for Kent State University. Um, and to answer it, I'd like to bring uh, somebody in, if that's OK, an alumni from the school. Just give us one <laughs> sec. Hi, Can you see my cat box? I'm trying to do yeah. <laughs> it. Hi, everybody. How are wow. you? Hi. Hi. Sending love to you. Love you. Hi, Terry. Love you so much. This is my uh, favorite job so far this week. I've had a lot of things I <laughs> love to jump through. How did, how did the contest go yesterday? My favorite hoop. Uh, well, I didn't. I didn't make the cut. So. Oh, I'm sorry. I felt kind of bad, but you know, I guess that's normal. Yeah, yeah, it happens. If you invest in something, maybe you know you miss it a little bit when it goes away. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so <laughs> Alan, why, <laughs> I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Why should a student attend Kent State University? Oh my gosh. Okay, I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, <laughs> let's say there are five reasons. Okay, I'm just making this up on the fly. There are probably 25 reasons, but one is location. That's a great place to go to school. Mm. If you want to know more reasons why that's a great place to go to school, you can send me some messages and we can talk, but just take my word for it. Good location. And then you take off and you go to the, go somewhere else. After school. Mm. And it's reasonably priced, I would say, in comparison because it's a state school. You know, I always tell my students, you don't have to, it's great if you can, but you don't have to go to a special school to be an actor. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a skill that you learn and with musical theater, which is what, that's that's number two, the other reason to go to Kent State would be because it's a BFA in musical theater. <laughs> you know, you kind of, where is my diploma anyway? Um, and I heard you chatting before I came on. I remember it being a triple major. Mm. Am I off base there, Terry? It felt like, like I could never really get it all done. Right, mm -hmm. everything that that was 
required of me. I did, but you always have that feeling of like tech week, like catching up. I mean, it, it feels normal to me now. Pursuing that, what I thought felt like a triple major. Now I was only at Kent State for three years because I was a transfer student. But there are two reasons. The third reason I guess would be the people mm. slash facility, you know, yeah. everything that people have to offer. And I mean, I went to two different high schools, three different junior highs, <laughs> two different colleges. I've lived in like 25 different places. And the people that I met at Kent during my three years there, I don't have any friends that are closer than those people, including Terry, even though, you know, if we don't see each other, that doesn't really, you know, those kind of people, it doesn't matter. Yeah. No, Your I, soul connection. Yeah. I mean, I, I was just trying to, like, I was, I trying to remember all the drama. I mean, there's so much drama, but you go through it together, you know, and you, right. that, you learn how to be an actor when you live through life. I think this is a side part, another side part. We have three reasons, right? Yeah. People, I mean, I, the BFA and the location, that's probably enough, but I mean, there are more. I love yeah. Terry. I, I think Terry is uh, one of the best people in the business. She is so smart. She looks after her kids uh, and she champions their successes. Um, what, and what, she, Terry is a, an incredible actor. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Do you want to be called actress? I, don't, I guess actress. Okay. Don't, don't make anything special for us. It's okay. <laughs> you know, but that's something that was so, it was just because so, I never knew any actors when I was a kid, even though I wanted to be one. And so Tara is a real actor and I just, you know, you want to do everything the way she does it and you want to do it great so that she can be proud of you. Like that was the feeling that we had with Terry. It's pretty right. special. God, I'm getting misty eyed. Thank you. I hope I can live up to your praise. And I never cry. I know. It's like it's, I slathered on. But the thing is, I wouldn't say anything if it wasn't true. I know. I just want to say I think the subject. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. <laughs> You're welcome. You. I'm glad thank I'm here. You. Yeah, thank you. So those are <laughs> we got off. <laughs> the lake, <laughs> like right there by Lake Erie, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I'd say the people, maybe people take up two of the five. And then the last one would be the the program. I, I remember that we focused we focused on original material including material that was written by students. Mm -hmm. And one of our shows went to the ACTFs, one of the original shows that was written by students. That's something that not every school focuses on. I think that you pro they probably still do, I'm guessing, because for one, Terry's still there. <laughs> Some of the people are still there that were there when we were, I don't know if they still do that, but that, that would be the final, fifth and final, and then someone else can have the floor. But those are pretty good reasons, right? Yeah. Definitely. Alice, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Nicole? Yeah, so next, um, same question, but we're going to bring in a guest for this. I'll bring in this guest now, and then I'll ask the question to him for Audubon University. We're going to say, why should the students choose Audubon? Hello. Hello. We have two. Hey. Hello. Hey. How are you all? Good, how are you? Uh, very well, thanks, Jordan. Good to see you, Matt. Hey, good to see you too. Oh my goodness, this is a whole new technology. This is incredible. I know. It's <laughs> right? Yeah. So, guys, tell us why should a student choose Audubon University? You want to go first, Jordan? Um, uh, sure. I I chose it for the acting program um, and the dance program when I shadowed i sat in on an acting class for three and a half hours and um to be honest with you it was not on my radar it wasn't a place that i was i had i knew anything about um but i shadowed and uh dr john stefano who was the head of the department at the time took time out of the day for someone who literally just dropped in out of nowhere unannounced no appointments or anything and uh he set up an entire day for me. And I, sa I sat in that acting class. Um, I think they were sophomores at the time. And I learned more about acting and the craft and store of, of storytelling in that three and a half hours than I had in the previous 10 years of my life around theater. And it was a perfect summation of 
I was like, if I can learn that much in one class, what can I learn in three and a half years? Mm. So that's, that's kind of why I chose to go to Otterbein. All right. Uh, so I, I'm a, I'm a big proponent that, um, students should visit schools that they're going to, uh, go to. Um, when I went to Otterbein, like like Jordan, I didn't know a lot about Otterbein. I'm actually from Columbus, a suburb of Columbus. And um, though I love my parents, I didn't really want to stay around Columbus. Uh, I didn't want to have that close proximity to the parentals. Right. Um, and so uh, Otterbein was not at the top of my list. And when I went to visit the school and I went to audition, it was, in my experience, by far the most personal experience I had uh, with with the faculty and the admission staff. Um, and it was the only school that I went to where uh, in the audition interview process, I was asked questions beyond uh, beyond craft and why I wanted to be an actor. Um, and it's sort of emblematic on what Otterbein sort of stands for. It, it is a conservatory experience in a liberal arts setting where a greater education and experience of a student and of life is sort of valued and encouraged. Um, and I felt really at home there and comfortable to sort of like explore and ask bigger questions um, and use those questions in class. Um, I find that uh, one, of, one of the things that I am able to employ in my work um, is that Otterbein did not have a sort of acting education set up in one mode or technique, which a lot of schools um, can do. Uh, the musical theater program and the actors are all in acting class together. Um, and it's many, many hours a week. Um, there wasn't another musical theater program that I visited where acting class was um, multiple hours a day. Uh, Acting is the forefront of the program and every teacher is basically teaching a different technique or a different style that you can sort of add to your toolbox. And some of them are useful for you. Some of them are, are less useful. Uh, but I found that when I left, I had such a deep box of tools to use um, from so many different perspectives that I felt equipped to take on different jobs and different roles uh, and felt really confident when I left. So I felt like it was a very valuable education in a, in a place where um, I was valued as a human being, not just an actor. And you know, the, the proof is in the pudding. You guys are both leading massive television shows right now. You know, at, at clearly the acting has got to be so strong at the program to land where you're at now. Thanks, Danny. Yeah, of course. I, I love both of your work so much. Um, I have another question about campus life. Can you tell me a little bit about campus life at Otterbein? Yeah, um, Otterbein is is very small. Uh, it was a little bit larger than my high school, um, and I was I was a little nervous about that. I kind of wanted a larger uh, university feel, and if that's something that's really important to you, uh, that's not the Otterbein experience. Mm -hmm. um, what I what I ended up loving, and again, I think it's 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 really difficult to know what you need when you're 18 and trying to choose schools. Um, and you think you know what you need or you want, and sometimes what you get is is uh, better. Yeah. Um, our liberal arts classes that we were taking outside of the degree, my classes had 20 people in them. Mm. Uh, so, you know, we're, you're taking a philosophy course and you're getting to ask bigger questions. My first philosophy course was philosophy of art. And I got to ask these bigger questions about what is art? What does it mean to be an artist? Uh, you know, what are the ethics of art around 20 people and sort of get riled up in these arguments and then run to acting class and use, you know, sort of this like fuel of frustration, like from arguing with some student uh, and, and, you know, go to an acting class for two hours. You see the same people around campus. It's small, it's personal. My acting class, um, was 12 people wow. and so I spent two hours a day minimum with the same 12 people uh, and it created this environment where it became really familial everyone trusted each other and the sort of work that we were able to discover and build and and the things we were able to learn 
with between 12 people over the course of four years, it was, it was pretty beautiful. Uh, and so this sort of small familial type vibe um, is, is sort of what you get at Otterbein. And if there's anything uh, that's, that is uh, more metaphorical is that our alma mater at Otterbein isn't called the, the fight song, it's called the Otterbein love song. And that's sort of like the vibe that you get at Otterbein. So yeah, I, and that, I mean, after that answer, I want to go to Ottawa. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's pretty magical. It's pretty yeah. magical. Jordan, same question, campus life. Yeah, I mean, you know, I actually had the opposite um, desire. I, I didn't want to go to a big university. Um, I didn't, I've, I've, I have, I get anxiety a lot when I'm surrounded by large copious amounts of people. Um, and so I was looking for a more personalized kind of experience, but what, I, what I loved is exactly what, what Corey loved, which is the INSTs and the classes you take outside of, of your theatrical curriculum, which is very, uh, stringent, help, help you help to inform what you're doing in, in acting class. I took, a uh, one of my first philosophy classes there was theology of social justice with Dr. Glenda Jackson, Glen, uh, Glenda Jackson. And she changed my life, changed my life. And, and I loved, it was such a small campus that you can walk across the entire place on the good foot in five minutes. And so, and so, uh, you, you run into a lot of the same people, you get to know a lot of people, even just outside of your acting uh, your acting classmates, um, because it is such a small campus. I did a lot of, uh, I, I, I did a lot of intramurals. I, I played flag football. I, there was a faculty staff versus student football game that I would participate in. I'd go over to the bubble and play some basketball, play some ping pong before acting class, you know, just, it was, it was great. It was, it was such a wonderful time. And like Corey said, every class that you took, even if it wasn't purposeful or you, or you didn't realize it, it one thing always informed the other. Mm -hmm. And so there was, there was quite a few semesters where I'd be taking, uh, you know, we'd have theater history and then you'd go straight from theater history to musical theater history. And then you'd go from that to your early, early Greek uh, philosophy and pre-Socratic philosophy that literally fed into the history of theater. And so it was just so many things from different disciplines that could build on each other while you were building uh, your knowledge uh, of craft and your knowledge of your own self and the things that, that you care about and the, the, the social uh, justices or injustices that you might want to take up a cause for. And so it makes doing theater make a little more sense. And, and it's easy to find meaning in what you're doing because you're finding meaning in every other class that you're taking and every other experience you're having on campus. I mean, if I, if I didn't go to Otterbein, I wouldn't have had the opportunity. Sorry, I'm outside. I wouldn't <laughs> have had the opportunity to go to uh, Malawi and, and observe. Sorry. Uh, and observe culture there and, and, and not just how theater is there, but how, how do, how do they view storytelling? How do they view music? How do they view dancing? And I got to sit in on, um, you know, some university students with some university students and observe in Africa, their approach to theater. And it was incredible. And that had nothing to do with the theater department itself that had everything to do with Otterbein University as, uh, as a whole. Mm -hmm. And, but I was able to again, use what I was learning in every other facet to, to just be a part of this other culture and learn about how similar we are even halfway around the world in this country that doesn't really have a theatrical voice, but they do um, because they have a voice. And um, that's what I really love. We did this project while I was there called Giving Voice to the Voiceless. You know, it's, it's always been a university that has been kind of ahead of the game when it comes to the treatment of people as, as human beings. Mm. And that's what I think I love the most about Otterbein and campus life there. Um, and it's, it's small enough that you can have an intimate relationship with your classmates, but it's still a university that you can 
have other relationships outside of that as well and other experiences uh, if you want them. And they encourage that. And it only makes your life better and your the art that you choose to do or whatever you choose to do with your life better. Uh, and I love that. Dr. John uh, and Stella Kane always used to say, you know, like we don't just, like Corey said, we don't just make theater artists and actors and craftspeople. We make people, you know, learn who you are as a person and whatever you choose to do, even if it's not this profession, um, you'll do it because you love it and you'll bring yourself to that fully. Man, I'm going back to college. <laughs> <laughs> also, a fun, a fun little uh, tidbit about Otterbein. It's one of the first universities in the nation to accept both women and African-Americans as students. From, from its inception, from yeah. the get-go, wow. from the time it started, women so, and African-Americans. Yeah. It, wow. has, it has a very, very progressive history in, in that right. It's fantastic. Corey, Jordan, thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, I, I'm huge fans of your, of your shows. Can you please uh, give us a social media handle, Corey, where we can follow uh, yeah. you and your journey? Uh, my Instagram is at Corey Michael Smith, C-O-R-Y. Uh, and then my um, Twitter handle, uh, my name's too long, so it's at Mr. spelled out, M-I-S-T-E-R underscore C-M-S. Uh, but I don't like Twitter, so give me a follow on Instagram, say hey. Cool. Thanks. And Jordan, I know you're not into the social, but I'm sure I'm we'll, we can watch you on Charmed or yes, uh, yes. Yeah, you on the next thing. I think season two just dropped. Is that right? It did. It did on Netflix. You can check Sweet. it out if you would like. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you awesome. for having us. Good to yeah, see thank you. Thank you for having us, guys. We appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Take care. Yeah. Thanks. You too. Uh, so, Terry, I'm going to pose the same question. Uh, <laughs> I know, right? The same <laughs> question to you. Why should a student choose Kent State University? Well, let me just back up for a second, and I just have to tip my hat to Otterbein. Uh, I have hired Tom at Porthouse Theater. He played the father in Next to Normal for us last season. He was Harold Hill in the music. Escaped us. I think he's on the road. Yeah, he, he, his uh, student actually introduced him to me, Matt Gittens, who I've hired uh, for three shows in the last two years, and uh uh, was supposed to have one of their students, one of their seniors, um, play Taylor in Brooklyn this summer. So I can attest to the fact that they are great people and with great training. So why should someone come to Kent State? A few things that distinguish us. One, we're an hour drive, if that, from Cleveland, which is one of the largest, which hosts one of the largest theater complexes in the nation, second only to the Lincoln Center. Mm. We, have a degree that is called an MFA returning professional. This is for actors who've had substantial careers who come back to school, most likely because they want to teach. So they kind of set the bar and they work side by side with our younger students. Uh, the class that graduated on the last rotation, Jen Hemphill was with Mama Mia on Broadway for five years. Steve Kramer played Jean Valjean um, uh, on Broadway. Um, Mavis had spent 17 years with Cirque du Soleil. So it, they bring in um, a mix of professional training and accomplishments and connections that really benefit our students. And then we have our summer professional theater. So our students can, you know, become equity membership candidates or receive their equity card. That's huge. Um, huge. But we don't just hire Kent State students. Like I said, we have Otterbein students. We've hired students from across the country. And uh, I think the other thing is our commitment to diversity and to really shaking things up. Yeah. You know, I just just got a, a huge donation and they asked what for Courthouse, what did I want that to go to? And I said, I want to set up a, a, a travel fund for diversity students because we kind of pay on the same scale. But when we really want to search and diversify our programs, we have to cast a large net. And those students, those young artists, you know, can't afford, a, 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 you know, an airplane ticket or yeah. to drive across the country. So, oh, yeah. Don't you worry, Nicole and I are working on that one. We've got some things up our sleeve there. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Terry, I have to say, you know, uh, we, we go to so many universities and we hadn't heard of Penn State prior. Uh, and, and when we went out for the first time, I my jaw dropped at the level of talent. Um, you. You, your students are unbelievably talented. 
uh, you know, I, I have quite an ego, but I don't know if I would have gotten into your program when I was auditioning. <laughs> Cause I mean, th your kids are, are really, really phenomenal. Thank you. Aaron, why should a student choose Otterbein? I don't think I could say it any better than Jordan and Corey did. However, I am an alum of Otterbein. Um, and I chose to come back to work for the department. Um, that's how much I think of this university and this program um, that I left the job that I had when this position opened up because I truly believe um, in what we're doing in our program and in the university. And I think what's great about Otterbein is we are in a suburb of Columbus, Ohio, and Columbus is booming. It's growing. Um, there's a huge arts community in Columbus. So right in your backyard, there are professional theater companies. There are all kinds of opportunities to branch out, to network, um, to start getting your feet wet. Mm -hmm. And I think that's huge um, for us. And, and we partner with Westerville, um, the city of Westerville. We, we partner with some of these uh, theaters in Columbus. We're collaborating constantly. So I think it's just a great place to be. Mm -hmm. And it's a great place um, that we're constantly evolving, right? Otterbein is always changing. Um, we keep our core values, but we keep innovating. And so it's a great place to be, um, I think, in the future, now and in the future. Mm. Yeah, again, your students are so lovely. We've, we've hired two uh, of, of your students before at the Growing Studio, and they are just the nicest, sweetest, <laughs> people, as well as being so talented. They are. They're great students. They're wonderful. Nicole. Guys, thank you so much for your time. Thank I'm gonna you. give us, yeah, it's been wonderful hearing about your university and how you're both creating people. And that is really just a wonderful job for educators, honestly. It's, I love being working in education. I get to do that at the Growing Studio all the time and I've done it in lots of other settings. And so I know the work and the heart that you're putting into these programs. And I just appreciate your ongoing support of your alumni and of your current students. And I'm excited to, to see more of your program. So very happy to be on with you today. I'm gonna end us off uh, with a lovely poem uh, and it'd be great to have you stay in the room with us as we're saying this poem. I normally put on a tiny bit of music beneath it. So I'm gonna do that. And then um, I like to take us through a thing where we're actually doing a breathing exercise with people. Um, so just do me a favor and put your hand on your heart. And we're gonna just take a nice deep breath in and breathe out. One more time, breathe in. And breathe out. Happy Juneteenth. And uh, this poem is called Take It. So, I can, I can test it's a bit confusing. In times like this, the question of who we are. How I wish there was a clear answer, but there is no record of me in that lineage besides that of being a slave. I write a new story though, friend. One that edifies me and my lineage and tells me I am glorious. And I did not deserve such terror. We did not deserve such terror. So I start here. As if from the womb I arrived with a lineage of people who were not confused about their worth. For no one created a narrative that would say that we were less than or inhuman. No one told us we weren't deserving of goodness. No one told us we were ugly or unwanted. No one separated us from the things that we deserve. Imagine if that was the case. Who would we be? See, we'd be strong. And unlike the resilience we have today, it would be strength. Unmasked. I can't even imagine that kind of power, friends. But know that I will imagine today. I will begin to imagine that my existence is and always has been valuable and glorious. And although they told us otherwise, at one time, we must rewire to remember ourselves. Oh, so far back we must go to tell our mothers and our mothers and our mother's mother and our brothers and our brother's brother and our sisters and our sisters, way deep down in our lineage that we were glorious and undeserving of such terror. We could be mad, but instead, but instead, for all that is good in the world, I'll just imagine. And imagine the freedom was always mine. I would walk differently. 
when I speak differently, would I? It's obviously not that simple. See, systems, they remain. But my mind is powerful. And I know yours is too. So perhaps, if maybe we thought we never deserved freedom, we could abolish that. We could walk about demanding it now. Like correct change at the grocery store or a gift from the boutique. That's something I paid for. I want it in a bag with a bow. I expect it. I expect freedom. And you are in the wrong if you give me anything less. Then you must feel the reckoning. You, I should not feel the terror. So I'll do that today. I'll walk outside and remind my ancestors, not that they are free, but that they have always been free and deserve freedom. There was nothing wrong with them. They were always worthy of something better. And the injustice they face at the hands and the knees of white men until today was undeniably immoral. Maybe when I tell my lineage that it will send shocks up my spine, up my heart, for they will be reminded of their worth and it will make my back sit up straight and my eyes cast up into the heavens for all of a sudden I will also know my worth. Even but for a minute, we'll all stand on the corner of class in an Atlantic in Brooklyn and know that this lineage is so becoming. It's like every single one of us knows this now and it makes this 27 year old brown girl that much stronger. My mother and my mother's mother and my mother's mother and my mother's mother, they know it now that we all deserve freedom and it is ours. So go on and take it. Happy Juneteenth, thank you. Happy Juneteenth, friends. Thank you. Good to have you guys. Thank you for joining us. Thank guys. you. Thank you so much for joining us for today's broadcast. Nicole, that poem is beautiful. I've heard it before and I'm glad to hear it again. Uh, please join us on Monday uh, as we are joined for the Broadway Q&A, Monday and Wednesday. On Tuesday, uh, we are doing a Take 10 on the Growing Studios Instagram. On Thursday, we have the Great Not-So-White Way. Do you know who the guests are this week, Nicole? Yeah, Nick Walker. Um, and then we have one other special guest that I won't reveal just yet, but you can go over to at the Growing Studio to see that announcement coming up this weekend. That's awesome. And then next Friday, we have two more schools. I'm going to check who they are right now. Let's see. Next Friday, we are joined uh, by the University of Michigan and Oakland University. Uh, please follow us on Instagram. You'll see our handles below, The Growing Studio and Playbill. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks. Bye.